Welcome to News Wrap Local. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Thanks for being here. Happy Pride Month. After providing a few brief updates on this month's local stories, we'll speak with our guest, Laura Rubio Cornejo, Director of Pasadena's Transportation Department. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena Media News Groups. PUSD Board of Education President, Dr. Elizabeth Pomeroy, delivered the district's State of the Schools 2022 address on Tuesday, May 17th at the McKinley School Gymnasium. Pomeroy's speech was centered around progress within the district and included a speech by a PUSD student who entered the district's dual immersion program as a kindergartner in 2009, the first year the program was offered. Prior to delivering her speech, Dr. Pomeroy told Pasadena Now, we're going to talk about student achievement. In particular, some landmarks will be revealed, special things that we have accomplished in these two years of pandemic, and when there were disruptions in the district. But PUSD was forging ahead through all those two years. The Pasadena City Charter requires that the President of the Board of Education present to the public by May of each year a State of the Schools address. This year's address also featured student performances and Spanish and ASL interpretations. On Saturday, June 18th, Dina Juneteenth 2022 will be celebrated in Altadena with a day full of events and live music. Local nonprofit organization My Tribe Rise is partnering with Music Changing Lives to bring live entertainment to the event. Juneteenth 2022 will also feature a kids' community fun center and activities including arts and crafts and yoga. A number of food and retail vendors will also join the event. Additional organizers include Rhythm of the Village, Dr. Sandra E. Thomas of the Altadena Town Council, and Rhonda Shorter of Miss Rhonda's Crack and Pop Gourmet Popcorn. Juneteenth National Independence Day commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. President Joe Biden signed a bill last year making Juneteenth a national holiday after the House and the Senate passed the bill. The event starts at 10.30 a.m. at a location yet to be announced. Last year, more than 100 residents celebrated Juneteenth at Charles White Park in Altadena. Huntington Hospital has introduced its new name and logo. The hospital, its physician group, and all of its outpatient programs and locations will now be under the umbrella of Huntington Health, an affiliate of Cedar sinai Established in 2017, Cedar sinai Health Systems provides a platform for high-quality health care institutions to collaborate and share resources and expertise. It currently comprises Cedar sinai Medical Center, Cedar sinai Marina Del Rey Hospital, and Torrance Memorial Medical Center. The affiliation between Huntington and Cedar sinai Health System went into effect after the organization reached an agreement with the Office of the California Attorney General. The affiliation builds upon Huntington's 128-year legacy, preserving its unique culture as a community institution. In a letter to community supporters, Huntington Hospital CEO Lori Morgan said, while the inpatient Huntington Hospital remains our flagship, Huntington Health best reflects our scope of services and the growing number of locations where we provide them. In the good news department, I've been selected as a finalist for three LA Press Club Journalism Awards, including one in the TV talk slash public affairs category for hosting this show. Winners will be announced later this month. I'm humbled and honored for the recognition and I thank Pasadena Media, George Filardo, Aaron Wheeler, and Joshua Morales for making this show possible. And thank you for watching. Another quick note, join the city's Juneteenth celebration tomorrow from 10 to two at Robinson Park or My Tribe Rises Dina Juneteenth celebration of freedom also tomorrow from 1030 to four at Altadena's Metropolitan Baptist Church. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. One. In May, the city of Pasadena shared the latest draft of the 2021 to 2029 housing element for public review. The housing element allows each city to prepare a community specific approach to how and where housing will be addressed to meet the needs of the community. 
The draft is available on the city's planning department website, cityofpasadena.net slash planning. The city council is expected to consider adoption of the housing element this, this month. Two, election officials are still counting ballots from last week's election, but the outcomes are coming into focus. If numbers continue to hold, Jason Lyon will avoid a runoff and win the District 7 City Council seat. Incumbent John Kennedy looks to uh, have kept his District 3 seat, and Jess Rivas ran unopposed in District 5. In the PCC Board of Trustees races, it looks like Steve Gibson will win incumbent Berlinda Brown's Area 3 seat. Christine Kwong maintains her lead ahead of incumbent Linda Waugh's Area 5 seat. And for Area 7, incumbent, incumbent Anthony Fellow currently has 50.17% of the vote. It appears to have been a changed election over at PCC following recent votes of no confidence in its leadership by faculty. More than 360,000 votes have yet to be counted in LA County, so results are not yet final. Three, City Council conducted the second reading of an ordinance that extends the period in which cannabis retailers must obtain permits from 36 months to 48 months. Four cannabis retailers have opened in the city, Varda, Essence, Harvest, and Sweetflower. A city staff report said the fifth approved retailer, Atrium, is having trouble finding a location. Four, Landmark Theaters has entered into a long-term lease agreement for the Lemley Playhouse 7 movie theater in the Playhouse District. It will continue to be an art house theater, and Landmark plans to make renovations to reflect their luxury style, including upgrading the sound and projection systems and installing comfortable seats. The concession stand will offer gourmet and healthy food, as well as traditional theater staples, beer and wine, and soon full spirits. The building was recently sold to GD Realty and plans for a development there did not include a movie theater when it went before the design commission. So the community was concerned that the theater would cease to exist. Now, the theater is expected to reopen this summer. Five, Jens Wyden, the Rose Bowl's chief revenue officer, will be the new general manager and CEO of the Rose Bowl Operating Company, effective July 1st pending formal approval of the full board of directors in the coming weeks. Wyden will replace Daryl Dunn, who is retiring as of June 30th after more than 20 years leading the stadium. Meanwhile, a city staff report predicted that the Rose Bowl will have a net loss between $4.6 to $7.6 million between 2023 and 2027. City Council voted to pursue revenue generating opportunities, including a family golf center, 210 freeway sponsorship signage, a potential citywide tax on paid parking spaces, a potential increase of the transient occupancy tax, and other opportunities. The council also approved the fiscal year 2023 budget plan for the RBOC, which reported the city covered more than $9 million of the stadium's debt this fiscal year. Six, additional emergency drought measures are now in effect in Pasadena and across the state. There is now a ban on watering non-functional turf at commercial, industrial, and institutional locations that does not include recreational or community uses. For residential measures, Pasadena is already observing level two conservation restrictions, which limits outdoor watering to two days per week from April to October and one day per week from November to March. Nearly 94% of California is experiencing severe drought. Seven, the Pasadena Public Health Department is proposing a $20 million budget for fiscal year 2023, which is a 5.4 percent decrease from the current budget. Department Director Dr. Ying Ying Go said grants make up 78 percent of the department's revenue, and that revenue is expected to decline in the coming year. The smaller budget comes at a time when COVID case numbers are rising and monkeypox cases have been confirmed in LA County. This week, an FDA advisory committee voted unanimously to approve Moderna and Pfizer COVID vaccines for children under five. Eight, the, the new 1 million square foot development at 100 West Walnut Street in Old Pasadena, near the 134 and 210 freeway interchange, includes a historical art installation and monument consisting of 10 bronze interpretive plaques, which highlight the history of the African-American, Asian-American, and Latino communities who were forcefully displaced by the construction of those freeways in the 60s and 70s. The plaques were written by Heather Lindquist and designed by Jennifer Bresler. Nine, at a meeting of the Civilian Police Oversight Commission earlier this month, newly hired independent police auditor, Richard Rosenthal, 
vowed to help enhance police accountability within Pasadena. He released an audit plan for 2022 to 2023 detailing his goals of assessing Pasadena Police Department internal affairs files and use of force investigations from June 2021 to this month, submitting a report on this in January, and monitoring monthly meetings of the police's use of force board. He said that he and the commission will have to do, quote, a bit of a restart after the previous police auditor abruptly left the position earlier this year. Meanwhile, July 1st is the deadline to apply for the police chief position, which will be chosen by the next city manager. City Council interviewed city manager candidates earlier this month. Also, City Council conducted the first reading of an ordinance requiring the department to obtain approval from the council before obtaining military equipment. And 10. The city has been working on designs for the Colorado Street Bridge Barrier Enhancement Project for more than a year to both prevent suicides and protect the bridge's historical character. But so far, no consensus has emerged on any single design option presented. Community input on four new concept designs by several local architects will be gathered soon, and then the options will be presented to the Historic Preservation and Design Commissions and the Public Safety Committee later this year before going back to City Council. Let's patch in our guest, Laura Rubio Cornejo. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Hi, thank you for having me, Justin. Laura has been Pasadena's Director of Transportation since 2019. She has served as the Deputy Executive Officer of Countywide Planning with LA Metro, and she's also provided technical support and guidance to the 88 cities in LA, in LA County for their respective projects. Prior to joining LA Metro, Cornejo was the Interim Director of Transportation and Manager of Strategic Planning and Intergovernmental Relations with the City of Montebello. So, uh, uh, Laura, can you, can you start by giving us a, a very brief background explainer on the so-called 710 stub? And then wh where, where do we stand right now in terms of the state relinquishing that land? So, Justin, the history of the 710 stub goes back decades, um, 50 years in the making for the city of Pasadena to get to the point where we are now. Um, several years back, the Metro Board of Directors, along with Caltrans, decided to move in the direction away of building the freeway and moving towards a transportation system management program. And that really opened the opportunity for the city to start thinking about what other options and opportunities there are to move people through the city and connect them with the regional freeway system beyond just a freeway. And so for the last three years or so, the city has been working very closely with Caltrans and working towards having that corridor relinquished back to the city so that we could really start to rethink mobility along that corridor and really um, bring it back to a neighborhood scale, making sure that people um, feel comfortable walking, bicycling along that corridor while also still being able to connect to the freeway system. Mm -hmm. Where we stand now, we have um, been very successful in working with Caltrans. They have been very collaborative throughout this process. We have a relinquishment agreement in place, which both the city of Pasadena has signed off on, Caltrans has signed off on, and we are waiting to be considered by the California Transportation Commission who has a final determination as to whether they would concur with the relinquishment agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the next steps. Trans uh, California Transportation Commission will take it up. And then and then what, what happens after that? So um, after the California Transportation Commission considers the item and presumably concurs with the recommendation, the corridor um, turns over an ownership to the city. So we're talking about 40 acres between Union Street in Columbia to the south, between St. John and Pasadena Avenue on the eastern and western boundaries. Um, we would continue to work closely with Caltrans, work closely with the Federal Highways Administration as we move forward into the next phase of this effort, which is really working with the community to envision what those final connections will look like, what the street network will look like, and if there will be any other land uses aside from addressing the transportation needs of the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, and assuming it gets approved, does that mean the city uh, owns that, that land outright? 
we would own the, the land. Uh, we would still, as I mentioned, need to work with the Federal Highways Administration as we move forward, um, but the land would belong to the city. Gotcha. And, and so how will the, uh, the city ensure that the Pasi community has a say on, on what that land gets used for and what gets developed there? And, and how long do you envision that process taking? So I would say there are two parallel processes that the community can anticipate. There's the longer term vision, which will look very much like what um, the city has already been engaged in with a kind of a specific plan process where we will look at the area, look at potential land uses, look at the connections that need to be made, what transportation uses we want to see there. Ideally, that would be multimodal in nature. Um, and so that's a longer process that will be take multiple years um, in the making to plan it. And then really comes a step of implementation. So recognizing that that process takes quite some time, we also recognize that there needs to be some more immediate changes to the area in order to make sure that it starts to function and operate um, at a different level, right? At a more human scale and is more pedestrian friendly, bicycle friendly and multimodal. So that process um, is really about identifying near term projects that focus primarily on three themes. One is really optimizing the corridor, uh, making sure that it's operating more efficiently, that we're connecting to the system in a way that continues to be safe and efficient. The other one is modernizing the corridor. Um, there, you know, there are parts and infrastructure there that there have been years where it hasn't been touched in decades. So we wanna make sure it's brought up to kind of modern technology. And the third is making sure that it's multimodal. Even as we start thinking about the longer term process, we wanna make sure that now we're addressing lighting, sidewalks, basic infrastructure that can make it a more multimodal and accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, in the 60s and 70s, when that part of the freeway was built, uh, you know, African-American, Japanese-American, Latino communities are largely displaced. So how will that be taken into account when determining what that land gets used for? Yeah, there's um, an unfortunate history that's associated not just with the history of the 710 freeway, but really um, the freeway system throughout the state and who was impacted most. And that is especially true here in the city. Um, as you note, Justin, uh, the residents that lived in that area were primarily communities of color, um, low income, um, 4,000 residents approximately displaced, 1,500 homes were destroyed and really changed not just the lives of those people, but really I would say the fabric and the, the feel and the culture of the city of Pasadena. So a lot of the work moving forward, we wanna acknowledge that and we wanna keep equity kind of in mind. We wanna remember who used to be there, provide you know those opportunities for being able to invite residents and continue to move forward and making sure that our city is diverse. Um, that will happen through the planning process. We want to make sure that we're providing opportunities, not just for different diverse voices to be heard throughout the planning process. That is really important that people with different perspectives, different life experiences be part of that process, but also acknowledge the history and who was there as we move forward and planning what will be there in the future. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and so let's talk about a couple of other transportation projects around the city. So the, the, the grade separation project, the California Boulevard and the Gold Line Track, that's been canceled, right? So, so what happened there and, and what other project or projects will those, uh, the Metro funds, the $240 million uh, go toward? So we received about $230 million to grade separate the L line at um, California. And as we started to do some preliminary work, we started to learn a couple things. One is the level of support that we had anticipated being there. Um, it wasn't as strong from the community. They understood that there was a need to fix that area and make it a little bit more efficient, but they weren't quite sure that a great separation was really the, the best solution. Secondly, we developed some initial cost estimates working very closely with some other agencies. And what we learned was that the cost for that grade separation was really well beyond the funding that had been allocated to us. So city council directed us to look at other potential projects along that area that still satisfied 
kind of the funding criteria of that funding source, which is really to provide um, connectivity along the 710 corridor. Um, we are in the process of identifying a list of projects that would um, provide mobility options, provide connections to the existing freeway. And a lot of those, going back to um, kind of an earlier uh, question you pose about those really looking at those temporary near term um, mm -hmm. solutions and, and making sure that they're multimodal. That process is underway. We will be presenting a list to our city council, hopefully later this summer. Ultimately, the Metro Board of Directors will make the determination as to where that funding gets allocated. But we've been working very closely um, with Metro, working very closely with key stakeholders along that corridor to be able to identify what the, that project list will look like. And and uh, do you know does that does that list include some of the items from the uh, some of the projects from the 2018 list, like the the uh, the 210 on ramp modification on on uh, Pasadena Avenue, the sort of St. John Pasadena wishbone area? I imagine that's tied into the the stub uh, process as well. Yes, it will build upon that previous list that had already been vetted publicly, and we will identify new projects knowing what we now know, having gone through this relinquishment process with Caltrans, we've been able to identify a couple of more opportunities for optimizing that corridor and making it multimodal. Gotcha. And um, uh, uh, switching a track a little bit, how is the city's transportation department, uh, how does it keep climate change and, and energy efficiency in mind when it's doing its work? I would say the transportation, you know, that is at the core of what the transportation department does. Um, one of the benefits of having a transportation department that really is multidisciplinary is that we approach everything from a multimodal perspective, whether it's transit, parking, uh, vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, it's all within the transportation department, which is rather unique um, in my experience. But what that means is everything we approach it through a multimodal lens, really looking at are there opportunities to provide um, mobility options for individuals and being able to provide those, making them efficient so that individuals have an option to not drive and really take another um, another mode should they choose to. But that, you know, people, choosing to take another mode really is dependent on making it efficient, making it safe. And so everything we do is really kind of through that lens. And so does that include complete streets as well? Is that part of the, the, the vision? Complete streets is part of that, absolutely. Um, making sure that we are providing multimodal solutions, but also respecting and recognizing neighborhood character, making sure that whatever multimodal solutions we're proposing acknowledges what that street looks like, what would be appropriate at what scale. Um, that is very much a part of the work that we do. And, and I, I just saw that the uh, the, the pro proposed budget for the, the uh, transportation department uh, came out. So what, what are the priorities in that budget? So um, if you saw the budget, you saw there's a long list of projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so lots of important things going on there. I would say in the near term, very excited about finally being able to deliver the city's first cycle track. Um, this will be along Union Street between Hill and Arroyo Parkway connecting to the L line. Um, very excited about you know the state of the art bicycle um, infrastructure. We are also in the final stages of finalizing a pedestrian plan where we will identify 10 corridors to be prioritized for pedestrian safety improvements throughout the city. So really excited about moving that forward. And then on the transit front, um, securing funding for a transit operations and maintenance facility is really key in order for us to be able to start transitioning to zero emission buses. And so being able to get a transit facility constructed is also at the top of that list. Great. Well, Laura, thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, to speak with us about your work at the Transportation Department. Great. Thank you for having me, Justin. It's been a pleasure. All right. Take care. Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. It was this day in 1952 when rocketry pioneer Jack Parsons died of an explosion in a coach house behind a mansion on South Orange Grove in Pasadena. 
His groundbreaking work in rocketry helped lead to the founding of JPL and helped make a space travel possible. But he was also a disciple of Aleister Crowley, the controversial occult leader who called himself the Beast 666 and practiced sex magic. I've written a new three-part series about Jack Parsons for Pasadena Now. The first part, published today, examines whether the explosion that killed him was an accident, a suicide, or a murder. The second part explores his breakthroughs in rocket science and how he and Frank Molina from Caltech played key roles in the founding of JPL and the American rocketry program. But federal investigations ended up dismantling their careers and robbing them of the credit they deserve. The third part looks at the occult world of Jack Parsons and his double life. Stay tuned for parts two and three in the next couple weeks. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of News Wrap Local. Tune in every third Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at PasadenaMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Sign up for my monthly email newsletter to get updates on my work by visiting JustinChapman.Substack.com. See you next month.